If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. We're doing a two-part series in one chapter. Last week we covered Matthew 24, and we jumped around the chapter to um, highlight the first part of the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus, to the earth. And so we looked at the rapture specifically and that period of time where God will take his church off of the earth to meet them in the air. And so he will be in the clouds, the Bible declares, and we will go up to meet him in the air. And so that's what we looked at last time. So this is Olivet Discourse Part 2. And we're going to focus in on the tribulation period, which will be after, or the, the second coming as well, uh, having those two parts where Jesus then will come in the air with us, his saints, in the air and to judge the world. So that's what we're going to look at today. Now, I was just thinking about um, how we've arrived where we're at today. And so we want to we want to utilize the scriptures for what they intend for God to do. Um, we are at a place where God has revealed himself to the world, but the world is reaching that place of rejecting God Overall, I don't know if you know, but atheism is a, a new construct. There was nobody in antiquity, nobody in the earlier centuries that didn't believe in God. What they believed about God uh, could have been all over the place, but just about everybody believed in God. And it wasn't really until scope trials and um, Charles Darwin, 1800s, um, that, that began this idea of evolution and things like that. And so... Now you have just all these years removed, okay? So I think there's five things that we use in apologetics. Apologetics is simply defending the faith. Five things we use to uh, show the existence of God. Number one, you have the cosmological argument. And the cosmological argument just simply says that because of the creation, it screams creator. And so you look around at the wonder of God's creation and he reveals himself in his creation. It just didn't come from nothing. There is no science that teaches that something comes from nothing. And so because of creation, you have the cosmological argument for the existence of God. And then number two, you have the te teleological argument for the existence of God. And that just simply means that there's order in creation. The earth just so happens to be the exact direct uh, distance from the sun if we were any closer we'd melt if we were any further we would freeze and so you look at order and creation the eyeball and just the human body and the wonder of the animal kingdom and, and just all of God's creation the order within that creation I was sitting in a college class and I wanted to take the study of geography where, where things are but they only had geology and so I was like study of rocks no I don't want to study rocks but what I learned was that there are these water tables all under the earth and there's precipitation that takes place and you have the oceans and the lakes and the seas and all of this water and the exact amount of water that goes up into the sky comes down through this water cycle and I was like no 100%? It's a perfect system. How does that work? Like, God, God did that. And yet they're teaching you, yeah, it just so happens, you know, whatever goes up comes down. And it's just, we don't know how that happens. God did that. The order in God's creation is just an incredible thing. So the second argument for God would be the teleological argument for, for uh, God. Then you have the moral argument for the existence of God and just all peoples throughout all times know right and wrong. It's intuitive. They know it. It's in their heart. They know that murder is wrong. They know adultery is wrong. They know lying is wrong. No society would continue to exist if it were not for these things. You have the historical argument for the existence of God, which says Jesus existed in a time and place um, on earth. And you have all the history of the nation of Israel and the Bible just continually comes true through archaeology and they find all these digs and these facts and there was a while that they said Pilate never existed Jesus mentioned this guy Pilate and then they discover oh my gosh there's a monument that was you know discovered Pilate existed at the time that Jesus said and it's just constantly uh, shown and proven the historical argument for God and then finally you have the personal testimony argument for God people come in contact with this risen Lord Jesus Christ and their lives are changed. Their lives are never the same. And uh, you take a drunk and you introduce them to Jesus. And somehow 
It, this life is transformed. You take a, a drug addict, a sex addict, you take all these wicked people and these sins, and it doesn't mean they're perfect, but you just see changed lives. More songs written about this Jesus, more poems written about this Jesus, more just people who come in contact with Jesus. It's just an incredible thing. So those are the five arguments for God. Now, God has revealed himself, and he wants to continue to reveal himself more and more, but he will not force himself upon anybody. And so our creation has gotten to the point here where they've resisted God for such a long period of time that we're in the upheaval that we find ourselves. We're in this horrendous situation in the world, and we see it all over, just, just the horrible things that take place to humanity, by humanity, and so at some point, God is saying it's not going to continue to go on like this. At some point, God is inter going to intervene and he's going to judge the wickedness that is taking place in the world. And some people think, oh, why would God do that? Because God is just and he demands justice and he cannot see these things taking place and not do something about it. Imagine a parent who saw their children being picked on, abused, violated over and over again, if that parent would not intervene, you would think, well, that's not a good parent. Well, God as our Heavenly Father sees His humanity, His cre creation being abused, and He speaks truth. And who will He reveal Himself to? Anybody who wants Him to be revealed. So all we have to do is say, Lord, man, it's confusing. There's a lot of different beliefs out there. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, but will you... Creator of the universe, God of the world, will you reveal yourself to me? And God is faithful to do that, but he will not force himself upon us. And so in Matthew chapter 24, right before we get to chapter 24, Jesus is overlooking Jerusalem and they had rejected him long enough. And Jesus overlooks Jerusalem and he begins to cry. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, how often... I wanted to take you under my wing, the wing of my protection, like a mother hen would do her little baby chicks. But you were not willing. You wouldn't let me. You resisted me over and over and over and over again. And so now I'm giving you over to your choice. And he says, your house will be left to you desolate. You're going to be destroyed, Jerusalem, Israel. You're no longer going to exist. You're going to be wiped off the face of the planet, if you will. And so in that, you get into uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, where we, where we were last week. And at the beginning there, the disciples decide to, you know, impress Jesus with the temple. And Jesus declares, guys, I'm just going to let you know, not one brick, not one stone is going to be left upon another. So that impressive structure that you're so enamored with, I'm just letting you know it's going to be destroyed. And that shakes the foundation of their understanding of things, right? The temple of God, this, this incredible building, this wonder of the world, it's going to be destroyed? What? It's not even completed yet. And yet he declares it's going to be destroyed. And then they ask him three questions. When will this happen? What will be the sign of your return? And what will be the end of the age or the end of the world? And then Jesus goes on to explain what that is in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 24 and 25. And he goes alone with his disciples and he's on the Mount of Olives. So it's called the Olivet Discourse. And it's Jesus speaking. And then he begins to give them signs. But he's letting them know this isn't the thing that's going to be the end of the world. We're going to get to that. So he starts out and says, be careful that people don't deceive you. Many are going to come in my name. They're going to claim to be the Messiah. They're going to come with deception. Be careful of that. So be mindful of that. But and then he says, there's all these signs that are going to take place. But these signs, and he says it over and over, these are not the end. He says there's going to be nation will rise against nation. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in all of these places. These are not the end. Because... When those things happen, don't we feel like they're the end? Like, earthquake, no, the world's coming to an end. Pestilence, right? Famines. All of these things feel like the end of the world. But Jesus is saying, these aren't the end. 
These are like birth pangs. They're sorrows upon the earth. And so they're like a woman who is in labor. They're going to come more and more frequent and they're going to get more and more intense. And so he's saying, but the end is not yet. And then right on the, one of the last verses that we read, because what we did was we chunked it together. Uh, I, I just chopped it all up, the chapter last week. And so we're going to kind of pick up where I left off. But he says something interesting in verse 14. Let me put my eyeballs on and we'll pray. Father, thank you so much. Lord, you tell us these things beforehand. You tell us what's going to take place. And uh, Father, I just pray that you would open up our understanding. Um, much has been taught on this. Much has been um, shared in disagreement. And so we just pray, Father, that you just give us an understanding of the plain text. And that we can understand, Lord, that you know what you're talking about. Regardless of how it's going to unfold and how it's going to happen, you're letting us know before it happens so that we can do something with that information. Again, it's not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but Lord, you want us to be encouraged that you know what you're talking about, but you also, Lord, want us to do something with that. And so I pray that we would apply it to our lives. I pray that we would share with friends and family and that we would be able to discuss these things because they are in the word of God. And so bless this time, open up our understanding. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit says to the church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so verse 14, one of the last verses of the section we read, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And so before the end comes, he's saying the gospel is going to be preached in all the world. Now this to me is amazing because as God's judgment is going out, as God's wrath is being poured out upon the earth, what is he doing? He's drawing people to himself to save them. What an incredible just mindset. And so the tribulation soul harvest will be Seven things will come into play, okay? Number one, the effects of the rapture on the world. And so imagine that, that this group of people that call themselves Christians and they belong to God, they're going to be taken off the earth and that's going to have an effect on people. Hopefully on those friends and people that we've shared with and they're like, ah, that's not how it's going to happen. You're crazy. And then something like that happens and they're like, oh, maybe they knew what they were talking about, right? And so that's going to have an effect. Number two, 144,000 witnesses like the Apostle Paul. And so as I said last week, Jews preach the gospel better than Gentiles for some reason. So 144,000 Jews are going to be proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ is the way to God. Number three, Holy Spirit like on the day of Pentecost prophesied in Joel chapter 2. And I, God says, will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. And you will prophesy and you will dream and do all these things. And so that is a reference specifically to that period of time as it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Number three. Um, oh, that was three. Number four. Chaotic conditions designed by God to shake humanity's false sense of security. And so you're going to see incredible things if you want to know what they look like. Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19 will show you a picture of the things that are going to happen during that seven-year period. And so again, chaotic conditions designed by God to shake humanity's false sense of security. Number five, the two witnesses. I believe it's Moses and Elijah. It's Elijah for sure. Could be Moses. I think it's Moses who will testify during the tribulation. And so there will be a period of time where they'll be testifying and people hate them and they'll kill them and they'll be dead in the streets for three days and then God will whoo, raise them from the dead and then ascend them into heaven right in front of their eyes. Again, that's got to have some effect, right? And so that's incredible. Number six, the three angels of Revelation 14, 6 through 13. Um, one of them, the first one, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. And so an angel, God is going to use an angel as well to get the message of the gospel out to the world during this period of time. And then finally, number seven, the world's population explosion. And so it took us from creation to about 1830 to get to one billion people on earth. And then it took about 100 years from 1830 to 1930 to go to two billion 
And then we went 30 years, 1960, we had 3 billion. 1975, we had 4 billion, so 15 years later, cut that in half. And then every 12 years, we've added a billion people on Earth. So from 1975 and 4 billion, we went to 1987, 5 billion. 1999, 12 years later, 6 billion. 2011, 7 billion. And it is projected 2023, 10, uh, 12 years later, we will have 8 billion. So right now we just have just under seven, uh, 8 billion people on the earth. It is projected by uh, 2023, next year, we will have 8 billion people. More people than have ever existed on the earth right now. And so you take all of those things and this will equal more people converted than in the entire Christian dispensation. And that's an incredible thing because as you read about death and destruction and judgment and wrath, you think, oh man, that's some bad news. But yet, what is God doing in the midst of his judgment being poured out? He's drawing people to himself. And more people will be saved during that seven year period than the 2,000 years in the church age before that. I think that's an incredible thing. And that gives me hope. That's again, why we share with people. And they might think we're off our rocker. And they might think, oh, you, <laughs> you don't really believe that, do you? I believe it. I believe it because God said it. God says that this is how it was going to happen. And look it, he's never been wrong. A lot of people think, well, this is allegorical, right? These are pictures. This can't be exactly how it's going to happen. What was it, allegorical with Moses and the plagues? What did, Jesus, what, did, what did God tell Moses? He says, hey, with a heavy hand, I'm going to um, get Pharaoh to let my people go. I want them to go and I want them to worship me, but he's not going to let them go unless I do it with a heavy hand. And so the plagues of what? Uh, the plagues of fleas and lice and uh, locusts and the, the Nile River be turning to blood, darkness on all the land and all of these plagues, right? Vegetation, gone. Were those figurative? Were those just, no, those were historically what took place. They were literal plagues until finally the last plague, the death of the firstborn. And then God did, um, Pharaoh did exactly what God said he would do. He let the nation of Israel go to worship. And so again, when we read about the tribulation and we read about these things that are going to take place and we read about the horrific things that are going to be happening, these are literal things that are going to happen. All right? So let's pick it up now where we left off. Again, I jumped around last week. So today we're going to cover verses 16, uh, 15 through 50, let me see, through 35. So the first verse, as we continue on now in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. And so all that other stuff was leading to this one thing. This one thing. Are earthquakes the sign? No, no, no. They're leading up to it. Famines? No. Leading up to it. Pestilence? No. Leading up to it. Kingdom against kingdom? No. Leading up to it. Nation against nation? No. No. No, that's not the sign. Those are all leading up to it. Jesus says, now pay attention. Let the reader understand. Hey, perk up your ears. This is the sign. When you see the abomination of desolation, of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, ding, 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 ding. Let the reader beware. Let the reader understand. This is what you want to take note of. And so, incredible, this idea of the abomination of desolation. Let me read you some notes that I took because I could be all over the place as I usually am. Okay? Essentially, the abomination of desolation speaks of the ultimate desecration of a Jewish temple, the establishment of an idolatrous image in the holy place itself, which will inevitably result in the judgment of God. It is the abomination of that brings desolation. In the vocabulary of Judaism of that time, an abomination was an especially offensive form of idolatry. Jesus described a gross form of idolatry standing in the holy place that brings with it great destruction or desolation. 
France writes, the desolation sacrilege is a literal Greek rendering of the phrase, the desolating sacrilege. An abomination in Old Testament idiom is an idolatrous affront to the true worship of God. And where will it be? Standing in the holy place. So it is believed simply that at the three and a half year mark, the Antichrist will go into the rebuilt temple in Israel and he will demand to be worshipped as God. The kind of precursor to this was in 200 BC. So remember, Malachi goes off the scene at 400 BC. Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament. John the Baptist would really be the last Old Testament prophet, but he would be the first prophet, right, the forerunner for Jesus, John the Baptist. Well, in between Malachi and in between John the Baptist were 400 years of no prophet silence from God. But in that 400 years, stuff was happening still in the nation of Israel. One of the things that was happening was this guy Antiochus Epiphanes and 200 BC would go into the temple and he would desecrate it as a picture of this abomination of desolation. He would take a pig and sacrifice him on the altar of the temple, which is horrendous, right? An unclean animal, a pig, and to, a, to the Jewish nation because of the laws in Leviticus. And he would sacrifice and spread the blood all over the altar. And then he would make the priests drink that blood, the priests of God. And so that was a precursor to what Daniel is speaking of that's going to take place in the tribulation period. Again, the Antichrist will go into the temple, the, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the three and a half year mark and he will offer himself to be worshipped as God. And that is the abomination of, of desolation. At that point, the eyes of the nation of Israel will see the Antichrist for what he is. And they will say, no way. And they will flee to the hills as God is giving them instructions. And they will understand that Jesus is the Messiah. So just an incredible period in history. There are several verses. Let me read you some of them in... Daniel's um, book that talks about this idea. Let's see. Here it is. As spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The mention of the abomination of desolation is taken from the book of Daniel. Daniel 11.31 says, They shall defile the sanctuary fortress, then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. This describes the complete desecration of the temple prefigured by Antiochus Epiphanes in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, Paul elaborates on the future fulfillment of this in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4. Let me read that to you. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so again, it, it, I mean, it's, to me, it's just clear in the scriptures. I know people confuse it a lot, but it's telling us exactly what's going to happen. I find it interesting that the apostasy or the falling away is going to come first. And if you look around, not many people going to church anymore in these last days. Actually coming to a building, well, I just kind of get my church on, online, or I get my church um, this way or that way. Just an interesting dynamic that people are falling away, the great apostasy. Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 gives additional insight. It says, and from that time, that daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up. Look at it, it tells us the days. There shall be 1,290 days until the end. When this sign is set up, the end may be determined. There will be almost three and one half years to go until the consummation of all things. Isn't that crazy? God is letting us know the exact number of days. Three and a half year point left in the tribulation. Seven years, three and a half years, he's going to go into the temple, set himself up to be worshipped. People are not going to buy it. They're going to be like, no way. And then you'll have the bold judgments that are poured out. My last two notes, through the centuries, the most common interpretive approach to the predictions Jesus made in this chapter is to see them all or mostly all fulfilled in the great destruction that came upon Jerusalem and Judea in AD 70. 
This approach is attractive in some ways, especially in that it makes the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 34 easy to understand. Yet, the approach that sees this chapter as all or mostly fulfilled in AD 70 is completely inadequate in its supposed fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. In this approach, the abomination of desolation is almost always understood to be the Roman armies and ensigns they carried. And then my last note on this verse, yet when we understand the importance of and what is said about this event, the abomination of desolation, we must give priority to this event even more than the easiest interpretation. And so there's a group of people called preterists or preterism. How many of you heard of preterism? Raise your hand. Preterism or preterist, okay? Preterist, the word, it simply means past. And so there's a group of Christians that believe that this Matthew 24 and all of Revelation chapter 6 through 19, the tribulation period, was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus came into uh, Jerusalem and just decimated it, right? And then 70 AD, the temple falls. And so I can understand why that was before 1948. Before 1948, there was no Israel. There was no temple. There's still no temple. It's, it's being rebuilt as we speak, but there is no temple as of now. And so I can see, well, how do we make sense of what this, well, okay, yeah, in, in, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and this destruction came upon Jerusalem. And so that must be all of this cataclysmic stuff that's going to take place. But that's not the case. May, what was the date? 25th? 1948. May in 1948. May 14th, 1948. Israel became a nation again. So for the first time in history, I believe because of World War II and everything that was done to the Jews, um, the world finally had this sympathy upon this nation and said, give them back their homeland. Just let them go back and they can occupy it. We'll, we'll call it Israel. They, they, they can have it back. And so Israel went back from, from the four corners of the, of the world. People just started heading back and Israel once again became a nation. And so we are futurists. We believe that these events of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, and the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, the tribulation period, are yet future. And again, there's, you'd have to really stretch a lot of what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 24 to be able to make it make sense that it happened in A.D. 70. Um, let's go ahead and continue on verse 16. This is the tribulation period. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then, notice what Jesus says, there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So that verse right there is a little hard to put AD 70 as fulfilling this section of scripture. Jesus is saying this will be the worst catastrophe that the world has ever seen. And I believe that there was worse, there are worse things that has happened since AD 70. The Holocaust being one of them. But just horrible, horrible, horrendous things. Human trafficking today, horrible. Verse 22, and unless those days were shortened, in other words, unless those, that it's three and a half years, it's not, you know, forever. Uh, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. We'll go over these last two verses here. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So verse 27, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, the second coming of Jesus will be seen by everyone as lightning is seen in the sky. If you were to look at the events, let's see, I wrote them somewhere, that are taking place. Here they are. 
you'll have the rapture of the church. What needs to take place for the rapture of the church to, to happen? Nothing. Prophetically, biblically speaking, nothing needs to happen. So the rapture of the church. And again, we, Calvary Chapel, we believe that there's, it's a pre-tribulation rapture. That the church will be taken out before the rapture of the church. Some people believe, some Christians believe that it'll happen in the middle when the Antichrist, you know, shows himself to be who he is. Some people believe that it'll happen at the end. I personally don't believe it can happen at the, at the middle or the end because and then you would be able to count down 1,290 days. So I, no one knows the day or the hour. So the rapture of the church is the event that will start off. Then you have this seven-year tribulation period. In the seven-year uh, year tribulation period, you have three forms of judgment. I don't know if you guys have read Revelation, but there's a seal. It's believed to be the title deed to the earth. And John is given this vision of the things that are taking place. So God is showing him these pictures. And the Bible says that he begins to cry. He begins to weep. Because no one on earth, above earth, or under the earth is worthy to open the seals, the title deed to the earth that the enemy, the devil, took from Adam, if you will. And so in that, He's told, John is told, stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah is found to be worthy to open the seals, to take the scroll and to open the seals. And so Jesus is able to take that seal because he redeemed the earth back from Satan. And so he begins to open the scroll and one seal at a time. The seals are judgments that begin to pour out. The first seal in the scroll is... The four, uh, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it's called usually. People, I think they refer to that. The four horsemen, right? And so the first one is what? A pale horse. And it has this rider on it, the Antichrist, who has a bow but no arrow. And so he comes in this false peace. And then you have all of these judgments in those seven seals. That's in Revelation chapter 6. The seventh seal reveals the trumpet judgments, another seven set of judgments that come. That's in Revelations 8 and 9. Okay, And then that comes to the three and a half year period where the seventh trumpet reveals the seven last bowl judgments. The bowl judgments are the worst of all the judgments and that's the great tribulation, the period of time that Jesus said no nor ever will be. The worst time in all of history and that's in Revelations chapters 15 and 16. Once that seven-year period of judgment is done, then you have the glorious appearing where Jesus comes back with us in the air. Every eye will see him, and he judges the world, and we just watch. He kind of fights Battle of Armageddon and all that stuff, okay? And so that's the picture of what's taking place in that. Lightning comes from the east and the, and the west. And then that last verse we read, for whoever, uh, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. If you read through the book of Revelation, what you discover is there's two meals. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb, where those who know Christ will be uh, invited to heaven and have this marriage supper for seven years. It's like a seven-year honeymoon, if you will, for the bride of Christ. Marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will eat, as opposed to those left on the earth will be eaten. Those who will be judged, it says the blood will go to the bridle of the horse. Just just incredible things that are going to take place where a lot of people are going to die. So we will eat or be eaten, according to that. And that's what that verse means. Okay? All right. I'm going to read these last two sections, 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so that'll be, even though judgment is going out, God will gather his to himself. And then finally, verses 32 through 35. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, you know that it is near at the doors. 
Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, a lot has been said about this. Part of the preterist view of saying that this stuff happened in AD um, 70 is because of this verse, because it says this generation will, that begins to see these things. And so they saw the destruction of the temple. So they're saying, look, he's saying this generation. But another way to look at that is that word in the Greek is ethnos. And it means more than just these people who are alive at this time. This group of people, ethnos, this ethnicity, these Jews. And again, they became, again, that nation in um, 1948. Let me read you what Chuck Smith writes on that section. He writes, Jesus uh, cited the budding of the fig tree or the restoring of Israel as a nation as a sign that we are getting close. And God has miraculously brought Israel back as a nation in 1948 and has preserved and protected them. The word translated generation usually refers to a national or ethnic group. There are people who have tried to calculate how many years a generation is to figure when Jesus would return, but that is probably stretching the meaning of the translation generation. He finally says, Jesus was probably referring to the preserving of the ethnic identity of the Jewish people. Even though they would be dispersed all over the earth, it is miraculous that a people without a homeland for thousands of years could still maintain their national identity. It is unprecedented in history, but God has preserved them and brought them back, and this lets us know that the time of the end is drawing near. In conclusion, so you have this period of time that the Bible says a lot about. There's a lot of print covered in this last seven year period of God's judgment or wrath being poured out upon the world. And I think for us, um, we definitely, it should encourage us to get the word out. The book of Revelation is a very, very difficult book to teach because of that judgment that just continues from chapter 6 all the way to chapter 19. And you see the cataclysmic things that are going to happen to this earth, how many people are going to die, the beautiful thing, how many people God is going to save with this population explosion of 8 billion people in the world. All, all that's beautiful, but at the same time, it's, it's hard. It's a difficult thing. And so what that should encourage us to do as Christians is, again, to get the word out, to share the love of God with people. God will reject nobody who wants to know him, but he will force nobody simultaneously. He will respect individuals' free wills. And so hopefully through this, we can see, wow, man, God has said what was going to happen before. God is telling us what's going to happen in the future. It's hard to get through, at least for me. I understand that it's hard to sit through as you listen to this. But at the same time, God knows what he's talking about. And we should be encouraged to be able to get the word out. And then not only that, we know how the world's going to end. So when they say it's going to end because of global warming, we can say, no, it's not. No, it's not. Global warming may be real or not real, whatever, whatever you want to believe, but it's not going to end through global warming. It's going to end because we have too many cars on the road. No, it's not. God told us how it's going to end. It's going to end in nuclear cataclysmic events when it's all said and done. And so in that, we can see through Peter and Revelation, again, 6 through 19, exactly how it's going to end. And again, that should bring us a peace to live today to live with what's in front of us, to not freak out about the future, to not be depressed about what's, you know, oh my God, this is going to happen. Just all anxious and all that. God's saying, no, 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 no. Just back up life to today and love the people that are in front of you and be careful not to be overwhelmed by all this. I'm telling you exactly how it's going to happen so that you won't be overwhelmed, so that you don't let whatever the prognosticators out there tell you lies. We can be aware. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you know the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. And Lord, prophecy is one of the things that lets us know that you know what you're talking about. We can see the predictive prophecy in the scriptures that has already been fulfilled. And Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we can take comfort in knowing that you know what you're talking about. 
And so, Lord, I pray that this would, though a very difficult topic to get through, but this would cause us to be just challenged to be able to love those people that are in front of us and to realize that life is short, Lord. We're here today and gone tomorrow, as the scripture says. Life is but a vapor. And so eternity that goes on forever and ever is what we were created for. And I pray, Lord, that we would live with eternity in mind. So thank you for your word. Thank you that you tell us these things. Continue to reveal, Lord, things to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Do me a favor. Let's go ahead and stand for this last song. If I've perked your interest or I've provoked you to, I don't know what you're talking about, then feel free to hang out and ask me any questions that you have. And I'll point you to Bible scholars that I am not to be able to help you get through some of this.